tonight on NJ Spotlight News, no guns allowed. A New Jersey appeals court reinstates a no gun zone in certain public areas and gatherings. We're fortunate to have one of the lowest rates of gun violence in America. You're six times more likely to be shot in Mississippi than you are in New Jersey. And parental notification. Three more districts, Middletown, Marlboro, and Manalapin, adopt new policies alerting parents of their child's gender identity. I am tired of the government and other people trying to co-parent with me, trying to tell me what's right for my family. What you want to do is rip away any form of comfort that we have. Also, lawmakers push to ban Delta 8 cannabis products here in the state, citing the unregulated items pose dangerous health concerns. This is available to your children in places that are around the corner from your house, and it is very bad for them. Plus, good news for Jersey commuters. The collapsed portion of the I-95 overpass will reopen this weekend. Your traffic nightmares are over for now. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Wednesday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. Concealed weapons are banned again in New Jersey, but only in certain spaces and not permanently. A decision issued late Tuesday by a federal appeals court reinstated parts of the state's new law that prohibits carrying guns in so-called sensitive places, making it illegal to have a gun at parks, beaches, museums, casinos, entertainment facilities, and other public areas, but you can still carry in moving vehicles and on private property at the owner's discretion. Prior to this week's ruling, U.S. District Court Judge Renee Marie Boom blocked most of the state's new rules from taking effect. It's just the latest in what's become an ongoing battle as the state tries to preserve restrictions gun rights groups have been fighting since they were enacted last year. So does this new order mean the state could win this fight? I'm joined by New Jersey Attorney General Matt Plotkin. Attorney General, first, uh, thank you for your time. I guess I'd just like to get your reaction to this ruling, and I'm wondering if it surprised you at all, given what the rulings have been up until this point. Well, thank you for having me, Brianna. And, and no, it didn't surprise me, because we've been saying all along that the law that the legislature uh, dutifully considered and that the governor signed back in December is entirely consistent with the Second Amendment. And uh, with the Bruin decision. And we've been saying that in our papers, we've been saying it publicly, and we've been saying that the decisions at the lower court not only were inconsistent with the Second Amendment, but jeopardized the safety of the residents of this state. And so I'm very gratified that the Third Circuit has resoundingly agreed with us and has reinstated the vast majority of the law that the governor signed that, again, will keep our residents safe. There are still, though, key parts of this law that are blocked. Um, having those guns in vehicles is just one of those. What does that mean for the state and for what's next for your uh, office? Well, let me be clear. 99% of the law is in effect today and is the law of the land. There are a few provisions, real, literally a few, that we are continuing to litigate. We will continue to fight for those provisions as well. But the provisions that are allowed to come back into effect, things like zoos and bars and restaurants where they serve alcohol and other places that we know when you allow firearms to enter the premises, you're more likely to have violence. That's just not my opinion. That's what the facts show in states that have had more liberal concealed carry laws for a long time. They've had much higher rates of gun violence. And in New Jersey, we're fortunate to have one of the lowest rates of gun violence in America. You're six times more likely to be shot in Mississippi than you are in New Jersey. And that's because of the strong laws we have and the way we enforce them. Yeah, well, the New Jersey Rifle and Pistol Club rightly points out that this decision, um, you know, is only impacting carry rights 
until for the duration of the court case. Um, so I'm curious how you move from there um, and what is in your jurisdiction to do? Well, that's been true about every decision. They didn't say that about the lower court decisions. Look, the, the decision that we received yesterday was something called a stay pending appeal. It means that we got an emergency stay of the lower court decision that blocked part of the law. So it put the law back into effect. So while it will go forward as litigations do, the key thing to know is that for the extended period that this case goes on, the law that the governor signed is overwhelmingly in effect, which is a good thing for the residents of the state. It's what we've been fighting for. It's what we knew was legal and constitutional. And ultimately, it's what we knew would keep the residents of New Jersey safe. Uh, Attorney General, I want to just uh, turn quickly uh, to this development that happened just last night with three boards of education uh, in the Jersey Shore area, uh, Middletown, Manalpin, Marlboro, voting to approve, um, you know, these so-called parental rights notification policies, uh, somewhat similar to what the Hanover Board of Education uh, did. And I would like to know what your office, if your office, is planning to step in, as you said it would, if other boards of education and run afoul, these are your words, um, of the state law. Yeah, we're closely monitoring what would happen in those jurisdictions last night. Let me be clear. These policies that target people on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity violate our law. We've been saying that. Courts have agreed with us. And ultimately, they will not stand. But what they will do is stigmatize and hurt children who are identifying as openly gay or LGBTQ plus or having um, gender identity issues. And that is shameful. And it's going to put kids at risk at a time where we're already seeing a mental health crisis amongst our youth. And I would ask every board that's considering this to understand, A, what they're doing is illegal. We will not allow it to stand. But B, what they're doing is most importantly hurting our kids. Will your office have the resources to take these on if it comes to that? We, we always make resources available to, to protect the rights of our residents. That's not something we shortchange, and we'll continue to do that here. Attorney General Matt Platkin, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Brianna. Yeah, the Attorney General's office will be keeping a close eye on the new parental notification requirements approved Tuesday night by those three school boards, and those districts likely won't be the last to take up similar rules. As our senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, the meetings were contentious. For three hours, a crowd chanted outside the meeting of Middletown School Board protesting what they called anti-trans rule changes up for a vote inside. The rally in Middletown mirrored parallel protests in Marlboro and Manalapan. All three boards ultimately voted to adopt revised policy provisions that would, in effect, out trans students to their parents. But first, debate raged for hours. Proponents argued for parental notification. I am tired of the government and other people trying to co-parent with me, trying to tell me what's right for my family. My kid, one of my boys, I have four boys, they feel like they're becoming, they want to be a girl. I want to know so I can be there and I can help. Middletown amended official state guidance so that if a student requests transition help, such as a name, identity, pronoun change, bathroom, locker room accommodation, or club sports accommodations, the school district shall notify a student's parents or guardian. Opponents called it discriminatory. What you want to do is rip away any form of comfort that we have, even if your children aren't uh, telling you uh, stuff about themselves, about their gender identity or sexuality. That speaks volumes about you and not them. The proposed revisions to the district's policies on transgender students unfairly target and discriminate against a group of people that already face heavy marginalization in our community. School boards have by nature been nonpartisan, but politics now intrudes and battle lines are drawn in an all-out culture war. Monmouth County's just the beginning. Both sides now work with state and national organizers to field slates of candidates and influence policies. Sean Hyland heads a conservative religious group. There are a number of districts where the school board members are trying to get a vote on these policies. They might have the minority view in the school board, so the policies are not coming up for a vote during this current session. I'm sure that'll be part of local school board elections later on this year. Monmouth County is a hot mess right now. What it's really about is a concerted, organized, well-funded effort 
to remove diversity and inclusion from our classrooms. Mike Gotsman attended the Middletown meeting. He founded a group supporting trans and LGBTQ rights that helped field last night's protests and hopes to fight back at the ballot box as well. It's political fodder. We know that over the past two election cycles, we were caught like deer in the headlights. We didn't see it coming. And basically, they used fear and rage to get themselves elected to the boards. The parental notification issue is in court where New Jersey's attorney general obtained an injunction against Hanover's policy, which it says illegally discriminates against trans and LGBTQ students. That policy remains on hold for now as the case heads for a hearing before New Jersey's Division on Civil Rights. I'm Brenda Flanagan and J Spotlight News. The state's new senior property tax relief program, Stay NJ, appears to be a done deal. Governor Murphy, Assembly Speaker Coughlin, and Senate President Scutari wrapped it all in a bow today, presenting the final plan. It'll cut property taxes in half for residents over age 65 if they make less than $500,000 a year, but put a $6,500 cap on it. Details are still being ironed out, and the full legislature has yet to vote on it. If approved, though, the plan will go into effect in 2026. In the meantime, the state says it'll give extra tax relief this year, adding another $250 rebate for senior homeowners and renters under the Anchor program. The plan comes ahead of November's election, where all 120 legislators are on the ballot. Lawmakers from both sides of the aisle have criticized the plan, saying it isn't sustainable. It's estimated to cost just over a billion dollars and still gives the largest cuts to the wealthiest residents. Say and Jay will dr dr dramatically cut property taxes for 97 percent of New Jersey senior homeowners, offering relief to tens of thousands of New Jerseyans. In our discussions over the last month, we've developed a framework that will deliver immediate relief to seniors and senior homeowners and renters. Uh, will increase uh, with the increases that the governor outlined to anchor benefits for seniors immediately. Meanwhile, state money is being doled out to more than two dozen health care facilities and providers across New Jersey to help them pay for security upgrades through the state Homeland Security Office's Reproductive Health Security Grant Program. The $5 million initiative helps providers considered at high risk targets of violence, vandalism, harassment or other illegal activity. Facilities were given a maximum of $100,000 to make security upgrades, which could include hiring security staff, emergency preparedness training, and activities. The state set aside the funding after the fall of Roe, and abortion providers started receiving threats from anti-abortion protesters. The state Homeland Security Office says abortion-related extremists continue to pose a moderate threat to the state. Maternal health care has been a priority for the Murphy administration. And this week, the State Department of Health released its annual hospital maternity care report card. It gives New Jersey high marks for bringing down the number of C-sections performed and serious health complications that can come with childbirth. But as Melissa Rose Cooper tells us, a significant racial gap remains. C-sections um, put women and their babies at greater risk for serious complications. So medical experts are applauding efforts to decrease the number of unnecessary C-sections performed in New Jersey. For babies, these complications can mean higher rates of infection, it can lead to respiratory complications, and it also um, causes intensive care unit stays to be longer. And we know for mothers, it also puts them at higher risk for complications such as um, higher rates of hemorrhage, um, infections and, and blood clots. The State Department of Health's latest hospital maternity care report card shows cesarean delivery rates have continued to decline during recent years. The percentage of birthing hospitals in New Jersey meeting the uh, human services healthy people 2030 goal, uh, a target of 23.6 or fewer uh, C-sections for individuals that present uh, with their uh, first pregnancy, their first birth uh, at term, um, single a uh, single birth, and a vertex uh, presentation uh, has uh, increased from 16 percent 
uh, to uh, 35%. Data shows New Jersey's cesarean delivery rate in 2020 was 32.9%, that's a 1% drop from the year before, and down from 35.7% when the state released its first hospital maternity care report card. Medical experts attributing the decline to improved birthing plans with patients, as well as increased access to labor support. This administration has had a huge emphasis on increasing the doula workforce by covering doulas under Medicaid, by providing um, training opportunities for doulas, by forming the doula learning collaborative. And there's really strong evidence that shows that doula presence or continuous labor support by doulas um, decreases C-section rates. And although there are emergency situations when a C-section should be performed, there are concerns that many of those procedures aren't medically necessary. Sometimes it is provider preference, whether it's because um, if it's better with their schedule or maybe takes less time. It can be that the patient requested it. Sometimes patients think that C-sections will be faster or less painful. The report card also highlighting racial disparities with black women having the highest number of cesarean deliveries, increasing their chances of complications, including postpartum hemorrhage and even death. We're looking at fetal distress as a number one cause for why uh, black women are having these C-sections. And so um, that's subjective. Are there these black women delivering in hospitals where the staff is fully trained in fetal monitoring and the techniques to, to manage that? And are we just jumping right to a C-section? Um, I've often heard Black women be threatened and forced into having C-sections against their will, even though they had time to labor. So I think there's a lot of um, miseducation and misinformation when it comes to where Black women are delivering at as well. Um, specifically looking at what the stages of labor look like and how long a woman should have an opportunity to be able to, to labor down. Medical professionals agree the key to preventing unnecessary C-sections starts with making sure patients are fully educated and involved in the decision-making process. They also say sticking to a standardized care plan could help ensure more equity in the birthing experience. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. With so much focus on launching the state's recreational cannabis industry, lawmakers may have overlooked regulating a similar substance. Delta-8 is a THC compound found in hemp. It's a psychoactive chemical that can produce a high, though it's not the same level as cannabis products, and it's entirely unregulated. You can find it at a convenience store in the form of gummies and other candies. Now the legislature is quickly acting to ban Delta-8, so it no longer ends up in the wrong hands. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports. This is available to your children in places that are around the corner from your house, and it is very bad for them. It's a substance called Delta-8, a THC compound found in hemp products that mimics the effects of Delta-9 or cannabis, and it's completely accessible to children right now. We heard testimony from a constituent of uh, Assemblyman Paul Moriarty, whose 14-year-old son almost died. There's been a rise in calls to poison control centers because of exposure to Delta-8. More than 2,300 from the start of 2021 on to a little more than a year later, and 41% of those calls involved kids under the age of 18. Little children that are getting into it are getting into gummies and other edibles, and they become uh, unco uncoordinated, glassy-eyed, they begin to walk funny, talk funny, some of them become very agitated. It's very scary to a parent when your child is is uh, essentially unconscious, non-responsive, staring off into space. We've seen seizures occasionally in some of these small children who get uh, into high doses of, of cannabinoid. It's especially dangerous because there's no regulation over the process of creating the Delta-8 substance. It's converted from CBD using a chemical process that can lead to the production of other compounds and can sometimes leave behind traces of the compounds that are used to do the conversion, which themselves aren't safe. It's hydrocarbons and other things. Because it's not controlled in any way, shape or form, it's, you know, buyer beware. Uh, we don't know what's always in them. We don't know how much uh, Delta-8 is in it versus other substances. We don't even know if sometimes if there is Delta-8 in it. We don't know what it's made out of, where it's obtained. So it, it makes it quite dangerous. The problem, though, it's actually not illegal to sell Delta-8 right now, something Senator Declan O'Scanlan calls a failure of federal lawmaking. The federal government 
uh, legalized hemp production and just didn't see this loophole, didn't see that these very low THC uh, uh, plants, material could be distilled from them to make very high potency THC products. He's introduced several bipartisan bills to both ban Delta 8 as well as to regulate it. We need to do this now, get these products off the shelf. And if someone wants to uh, continue to create them, uh, we need to, a, a regulatory uh, framework, testing, so that we know what's in it, and then the consumer can know what's in it. Longtime cannabis advocate and lawyer Bill Caruso supports the bills that he says protect the rollout of the cannabis marketplace in New Jersey. This is unfair competition, and that's not the lead issue for why we should do this, but it's, it's certainly one of them. You know, we're, we're trying to create a new industry here. We shouldn't allow this outside competition. We haven't even allowed yet regulated products of this type in the market, and when we do, when we allow a true edible market in the cannabis space, it won't be allowed to be marketed to children like some of these products are. The bills are working through the legislature now, and O'Scanlan is hopeful he can get them to the governor's desk soon. I am hopeful we can get it done before the summer break and put a stop to it now before we have another full summer uh, of these, these incidents. He only has two more weeks to make that happen. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. In our Spotlight on Business report, the state wants its money back. In a rush to get COVID-19 relief aid out quickly, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection wrongly paid out about $7 million to the state's fishing industry. And now the money needs to be returned. According to a state comptroller report released Tuesday, payments made to 37 marine fisheries didn't appear to meet guidelines for the federal CARES Act funding, saying they were made, quote, more than whole, meaning they received more money than their actual losses for 2020. The report says some failed to submit the right documents requested to be eligible for the aid. The report also found a few were ineligible because they didn't have at least 35 percent loss in revenue. It also accused the DEP of ignoring red flags. The state didn't name the fisheries that received the money. The DEP says it has put more controls in place. On Wall Street, investors still appear to be taking a breather from last week's rally. Here's how the markets closed. Support for the Business Report provided by Junior Achievement of New Jersey. Providing students with skills and knowledge to explore, choose, and advance their career paths for a brighter future. Online at janj.org. Well, the state isn't in a drought, but we are in the midst of a dry spell. And the Murphy administration is asking everyone to conserve water as we enter the summer season. New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection says reservoirs that supply drinking water to millions of residents have fallen below average. Statewide, we've had less than half the normal amount of rainfall for the last 30 days, and we're below normal levels for three out of the last four months. State climatologist Dave Robinson says New Jersey is running a deficit by about four inches of rain. Portions of North and South Jersey have entered the moderate drought stage, but there's no crisis just yet. It all means you should cut back on watering your lawn and landscaping and generally be mindful about water usage. And we'll leave you tonight with a welcome piece of good news for drivers. It turns out predictions that it would take months to repair the collapse section of I-95 in Philadelphia and cause just a major traffic nightmare for the area were wrong. The damaged section of the roadway will reopen this weekend to six lanes of traffic. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro said on Tuesday work is ahead of schedule. That's thanks to construction crews working around the clock, along with cooperation at the state and federal levels. Crews filled the roadway with a recycled glass aggregate, and they're in the process of paving the temporary lanes. It's unclear if the highway will reopen Saturday or Sunday, but if you're really itching to get back out there, you can still check out the 24-7 live stream of the rebuild. 
And that does it for us tonight. But make sure you tune into Chatbox tomorrow night with David Cruz for the season finale. David looks back on the most notable Chatbox interviews over the last year, from the Patterson Police takeover to climate challenges and so much more. That's Thursday at 6.30 p.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel or wherever you stream. A reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. I'm Nick Manis, 2023 President of New Jersey Realtors. Whether it's helping a family find their perfect home or securing space for small business owners, New Jersey Realtors have been helping their clients achieve their dreams for more than a century. No matter what your unique needs are, there's a New Jersey Realtor for you. Find your Realtor at nj.realestate/find. Life is unpredictable. Health insurance shouldn't be. For over 90 years, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey has provided quality, affordable health plans to New Jersey residents. We have served generations of New Jersey families and businesses and are committed to driving innovations that put you at the heart of everything we do. Our members are our neighbors, our friends, and our families. We're here when you need us most. Horizon, proud to be New Jersey.